My name is uh, Rick Riss. I'm uh, an analyst at ARC. Uh, I have a lot of background actually in designing, building, and implementing advanced controls. And in many cases, when you do that, the operator training goes with that. So um, we have some really great speakers today. Um, and I'll have a short presentation, and we're kind of going from the top to the bottom. I would uh, call your attention to the ceiling. You know why we're calling your attention to the ceiling? Because the last time we had uh, Steve speak with us, all right, a tile fell on his head. And for those of you that are under the chandelier, pay especially good attention, all right? Uh, so any event, that was uh, hopefully uh, a one-time bizarre rare event. Okay, we can go with the first. So operator training by doing. It was very interesting that in Honeywell's press release that uh, they basically were talking about training by doing. They were more associated with uh, training for maintenance activities, but when you can actually practice doing something, you really retain it. And so that's the kind of the theme of our, of our presentation today. Uh, so I'm gonna introduce all of our speakers first. Uh, Ron Sisko, he's O&M manager at Salt River Project at the Coronado Generating Station. We also have Dr. Steven Zitney, Director of Process Systems Engineering at NETL. Uh, he's done some very interesting work uh, with uh, simulation. And also, Dr. Turan Avaz, who is the Director of Certificate Accreditation Program from uh, ANSI, uh, American National Standards Institute. And we have also, as a uh, panelist, Joe McMullen, who is the Marketing Director at Schneider Electric. Uh, Joe is also very familiar with operative training simulators. So I want to start out by challenging your mental image of how you learned everything you know, right? You learned a great deal of what you know with simulation. You were playing with trucks and blocks and army men, dolls and modeling. That's a modeling and simulation. Photographs and videos are models of reality, all right? Books, real and fiction, are models that you extend in your mind. Acting, you know? You know, you are, probably everyone uses thought experiments to figure out, well, what if I did this? No, maybe I better not do that, all right? Uh, you know, you're constantly thinking and modeling your whole life, and that's how you learned a, a great deal of what we know. You know, with digital platforms, you know, we've brought modeling to a new level. So many video games are so much nearly realistic. Uh, some of the virtual reality technology and uh, especially is hard to distinguish from real situations. Um, <clears throat> the first thing I wanted to say is that when we're talking about simulation, let's talk about what are we actually simulating. And I, at ARC, we kind of break this into three areas. The simulation of the process, heat and material balance typically. <clears throat> There's a whole range of, of simulations and fidelity and different features. The control system also needs to be simulated. In some cases, it's simulated by a, a complete replica control system, hardwired. That was the old school way of doing it. Um, and then uh, more recently is a spatial simulation, right? Where we have, uh, doesn't necessarily have to have a heads-up display with goggles, but you can uh, have a 3D simulation on a CRT screen as well. Um, and I, I will mention, that, you know, these two little dot things in the bottom, you may not recognize those, but those are near-field communication chips. And there are some simulations, basically, where these are placed on pressure, temperature transmitters, valves, pumps, and various equipment throughout the plant. And using a virtual reality headset, there's one company I thought was very innovative, and I just thought I'd mention that, that you can basically walk around the plant with an intrinsically safe handheld phone or uh, uh, iPad uh, type device and run a process simulation as you walk near things. And as you walk next to a pressure transmitter, you can read a pressure gauge even, you can read what the gauge is. You know, you can walk next to a pump and by when you get close enough, you can see, oh, the pump is on fire. You can do a lot of different simulation activities without actually having a 3D model. It's very interesting. Uh, a company in Holland uh, uses this approach. Um, 
So <clears throat> the reason that we, we talk about simulation as being so important is because it really puts the control room operator, particularly console operators, with their hands on that mouse, handling situations, sometimes very stressful. <clears throat> uh, we see the same kind of simulation is essential for training pilots. Uh, you wouldn't think of training an aircraft pilot without going to a simulator. And obviously what we do train is we don't just train normal startup, normal operation. We train for failures. You know, what happens if this piece of equipment fails? What are we going to do? We put them in very stressful situations and this is a kind of a well accepted uh, <coughs> uh, kind of cone of learning model when you are actually have your hands on that when you actually have your hands on that mouse and you actually have to make that decision you will remember and this is particularly important in long runtime units like refineries that run for three to five years at a time very few operators actually get to experience a startup, all right? And several displays and overlays on that control system may only be opened during startup. And so unless you practice that in a simulation, you won't really be equipped to have the confidence to identify the situation and take the appropriate action quickly. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there's, it's very interesting to see how you would challenge uh, the justification of the simulation. You could ask probably most any one of these accidents that might have happened uh, two days before the accident, and you could probably ask most of the people that, well, that accident would never happen here, right? But the cost of accidents, both in terms of physical equipment, lost production, and lawsuits, and environmental penalties can be really, really high. Um, you know, we obviously see some of the big accidents, Fukushima, we saw the, uh, the uh, Deepwater Horizon accident, uh, we see refining accidents. It, it does appear that nuclear accidents have the highest cost. Some of those accidents are more than $200 billion worth of damage, say for approximately for Fukushima, Chernobyl being number one. Pilot, surgeon, heavy equipment. Uh, simulation can really help reduce those. One of the interesting things with ARC has studied the marketplace for simulators, and more recently we actually did an investigation of how different uh, operations in the electric power, both nuclear and fossil power, uh, chemical, oil, and gas, and how, how they were using simulation, what kind of simulation were they using. And we found some interesting situations. Of course, the nuclear industry is required to build simulators according to this front page of the standard shown here, ANSI 3.5. And that standard will very specifically say the fidelity of the simulator for various aspects, uh, you know, the type of a whole list of upsets that must be handled, you know, loss of instrument air, uh, loss of cooling accident, you know, all of those situations need to be addressed uh, in every nuclear power plant. And so you see the training simulation in nuclear power plants is a, is a large step above the type of training simulators you generally would see in chemical oil and gas. Chemical oil and gas has no such standards. And in fact, that's uh, one, of the, one of the reasons actually I brought Turan on this uh, session. Uh, and we're great to have him here because he can talk not so much about creating a standard for the chemical oil and gas industry, which, which I think what might actually be a very beneficial thing, uh, but more about how to certify training programs and why you need to maybe do that. Um, and uh, so without further ado, I'm going to let my speakers uh, uh, move right in and we're going to start off with Ron.